and uh, kick it off and get started for the day. Uh, welcome everyone to another edition of the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. Uh, as always, everyone is welcome here. Uh, please feel free to voice up at any time if you have any comments or questions or concerns. Uh, hopefully you've all had a, a chance to read the antitrust policy notice. So we will just move directly from that uh, into the announcements for today. Uh, so I'll pass it off to Solona to talk about any uh, announcements. Okay, so um, we still need more mentors for the internship program. And if y'all can help suggest anyone or spend some time with me or Min on that, uh, please let me know or if you've got any suggestions in regards to it. Uh, several of our members, our, of our TFC members, have been mentors before, and so um, does anyone want to, you know, encourage anyone else in regards to signing up and, and doing it on this call? I'm trying to sit there and see who we've got in here um, about um, previously being mentors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is we had our first um, quilt reboot meeting. Uh, it went pretty well. The uh, people who were originally in charge of the quilt, um, who are currently the quilt maintainers, were super happy with it. Um, and we're planning our next one for next week where we're going to be bringing in hopefully Silas from Burrow and um, some people from the architecture work group to talk more about the different structures because there's a, um, there were some different uh, pieces that were coming up. Some of them were like, are we just going to expand out in, you know, the um, inner letter ledger protocol to be more languages or are we going to go and look at some of the other protocols as well? And it looks like the group is also going to be looking at some of the other protocols as well. And we need to make sure that we don't accidentally um, over scope things. So we're working on that currently. Any questions? All right, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we will proceed into uh, the quarterly reports. Uh, so first up uh, is Hyperledger Burrow. Uh, so Sean, do you mind, uh, it looks like most of the uh, folks have had a chance to read through that, but um, maybe if you could just uh, hit on a couple of the key highlights of that report, that would be appreciated. Um, hello, yes, so, um, so since Silas is not able uh, to attend today, uh, I'll be covering for him. Um, just open up the page. Um, and I will uh, paste this in the chat as well in case anyone needs that. Thank you. I was, I was actually looking for that myself. Um, <laughs> okay, so we've had um, we had a, um, a couple of releases, but those most, mostly have been um, fixes that we needed. Um, however, in the meantime, we have been working on um, some some new features. Um, so one of those is um, dump restore. So we want to be able to introduce backwards incompatible changes. Um, without losing um, accounts and contract state uh, on the chain, so we uh, we can now dump the state of the uh, of the chain um, to a file, and then when you create a new chain, you can um, specify the the dump from the previous chain, and it it, it will um, sort of create a new genesis, which includes the the state from the previous um, chain, so we can. Um, we can uh, so we, we can introduce uh, backwards incompatible changes that way. Um, um, so when um, when when you do a um, when you dump the existing chain, that will in include the um, the height at which is done and the hash for the uh, for the state. When you create the the new chain off that um, um, of the dump, then um, a new genesis will be created with with the, with the appropriate hash for, for the state. Mm. Um, um, so there, there is some cons um, 
way of checking that uh, you're back at the, the previous state. Uh, there is a plan to create a, a, a fork TX to, to mark um, in the previous chain where a new chain will take off and what hash it will have. Um, but that's just, at the moment, that's just a plan. That's, we haven't implemented that yet. Um, we've, we've also done some fixes to our uh, proposal mechanism. Um, this will allow you to um, run a number of transactions in proposal mode, which means they'll be recorded but not executed. After, after that, um, it's possible to um, list the, the existing proposals and um, um, users with appropriate permission can vote on, uh, on a proposal. And once it's reached enough votes, it will be executed automatically. Um, so that's um, so th th those are sort of the, the two bigger features we've been working on. Um, we've started to look at um, start, uh, storing uh, ABIs on uh, on borrow side. So rather than having them as files, um, they would be stored on chain. Uh, this is making it much easier to interact with contracts. Uh, if you know a contract address, then you'll be able to re retrieve this ABI. Mm. And then you could, um, it would be much easier to, to call um, functions of contracts. Um, client side wouldn't need to know anything apart from the, the, the name of the, of the, of the contract. Um, it doesn't, wouldn't need to know its, uh, uh, its ABI. Uh, we're also planning to implement some, um, uh, some primitives for, for token economics. Um, Silas is, will be working on this. Um, okay, so uh, oh, yeah, but also we um, I've personally started working on Acility to to Wasm compiler. So as that progresses, um, I'm starting to look at um, having a uh, a Wasm VM in Burrow. Um, so when those pieces sort of come together, then we'll be able to execute um, um, Solidity as Wasm in in Burrow. Um, we've um, um, so we, we've had um, some contributions from um, um, some folks from IBM. Um, so we've we've had some bug fixes. Um, so it's it's good to see um, um, contributions from uh, more contributions from the outside. Um, Um, so, uh, yeah, so, um, no, that so, was, that was, that was a great overview. <laughs> um, I, I had one question, uh, maybe for you, Sean. Um, just on the the EVM and the WebAssembly uh, stuff, is that are you intending for EVM to be continue to be the sort of smart contract language uh, for Burrow, but it maybe would have a different execution engine with this WebAssembly VM? Are you intending to support, uh, you know, sort of more native WebAssembly bytecode? Um, so, uh, so do you mean do you mean oh, do we intend to replace the EVM as engine with a WASM engine? Right, or? right. Yeah. It, it, do you intend to replace the EVM with WebAssembly? And then also, what is the higher level language that you uh, that your user base will will be using? Right. So um, the the language will, will still be Solidity. Um, the, the existing Solidity compiler doesn't cannot produce WASM at, at the moment. Uh, so as a side project. Um, I've started the uh, um, Solang, which is a Solidity compiler uh, written in Rust, which will output uh, Wasm. Um, so th th at this this tiny stage, it's still a prototype. Um, as it matures, well, I kind of have to wait and see um, where we are. But but the intent is, we're, we're hoping that at some point um, the EVM uh, VM will be replaced with the Wasm engine. Okay, great. Thank you. Have you guys um, considered making a um, Solidity front end for LLVM? Because if you get just a Solidity front end there, you should be able to output WASM on the back end. That's how so many languages are um, compilable to WASM these days. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so my, my Solang um, compiler uses LLVM. 
So all it is is a, a Solidity uh, parser and then um, the HD has to be sort of um, converted to LLVM IR. The reason that I can sort of progress that fairly quickly is because um, LLVM provides so much and not only does it compile to WASM, it, it knows how to write WASM files. Um, so in actual fact, there isn't, code-wise, it's much, much smaller than existing Solidity compiler. Oh, that's exactly what I was asking about. Sounds like you're on it already. Uh, yes. Um, have a look at. Um, I'm so long. It's um, so it's a it, the code base isn't isn't that big. Uh, it's fairly readable. Okay, great. Are there any other uh, questions for the Burrow project? Well, I saw In there was a Blackstone. I have to admit, I looked a little bit. I don't know how much there is in there. I can't say that I, you know, I fully understand, but it, it claims to be interesting to a bunch of other projects. And so I, will, I would like to know more about what's in there. We don't have to do that now, but. Okay, so um, right, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm more of a, I work more on the borough side of the company. Uh, Blackstone is another part of, of the company. And this is, um, it's, it's an API for, for running um, uh, BPN on, on the blockchain using Solidity. Um, and this will allow you to, um, to, uh, to implement legal agreements on a blockchain. Um, as is written in Solidity in principle, it, it should run on anything which um, which um, which uses some um, solidity. Um, um, maybe I think Silas might be better suited to give a brief overview. Uh, um, yeah, can, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post a few links in the in the chat um, to um, things that are of interest around this. I mean, I, I, there is a link to Blackstone. I, I had a quick look. I can't say I spend a lot of time, so maybe that's my fault. But, uh, you know, it wasn't completely clear to me what's in it. And so I would have, you know, at, if, at some point it'd be nice to have some kind of high-level intro. Okay, yes. Um, so uh, Blackstone is, is a part that um, we were hoping to make part of Hyperledge at some point. Um, so it will allow um, the creation of, of, of a legal agreement where you have multi-parties um, to, to an um, agreement. Um, yeah, and I read that much, and that's why it, it got my attention, and, you know, from where I stand, which means I don't understand much of this space, but, you know, it makes me wonder, so how does that compare to what Clause is doing, for instance, with that core? project you know yeah. okay you know yeah that's an interesting question um i'll discuss with silas and um, um we'll um maybe try to um uh, find ways of presenting this um to the group yep thank you thanks for the uh the update there sean um we will move on to the uh hyperledger performance and scale uh scalability working group uh update now i do know that um, Mark is not here on the call today, and I wanted to reach out to see if there was anyone else from that uh, that working group uh, that could maybe just give a, a quick high-level update of the progress in the last quarter, and then also uh, open it up to questions after that. Um, so just looking here, I see Mick. Uh, I don't know if um, you've had any chance. It doesn't look like there was a, a whole lot of activity in the past quarter, but didn't know if there were any issues that anyone that participates in the, the performance and scale working group wanted to call out uh, before we open this up. Um, well, I haven't been active lately, but um, you know, the one issue in the update and in the comments was the whole discussion around the, the meeting they had with Stack and the potential to collaborate on a more formal, you know, benchmark um, uh, by, collab, you know, by, by actually working within that organization and it raises a number of questions about how does this actually work? Do we have to have like 
legal agreements between Hyperledger and Stack and you know, are are we creating a you know a standard benchmark, or are we just sort of, you know, providing input to what you know the Stack Working Group, if it was formed, would actually pr produce? So, I mean, I don't think we're going to get to the answers on this call, but I I do think that it's something we need to, you know, seriously consider. I mean, at the at the end of the day, you know, we can either, uh, you know, get my 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 position would be that either we can get involved and try and steer it in the direction that we think is the right direction. Uh, or we can wait for somebody to come up with a benchmark that nobody likes. So, <laughs> yeah, I think. Mm, wish Mark were here because it'd be a good. I I think this is this is sort of the the discussion because it that group has matured enough and given the activities that they have, um, making sure that they are somehow connected to the rest of the organizations that are thinking about performance benchmarks and standards and those who are actively involved in it. Um, so Mark and I were exchanging some emails about NIST being, you know, one of those that might be an appropriate one given their right. interest in right. blockchain, for example. Right. One of the questions that I had there is um, how aligned has the, the PSWG been with uh, the Caliper project? Um, so it seems like that's a natural part or natural fit for um, actually reporting out on those metrics, and I didn't know if um, there's been collaboration there recently. Sounds like maybe there uh, there isn't anyone from the Caliper <laughs> Caliper team yeah. at least that is sitting in those meetings. Is that a is that a correct statement? Really? Yeah, I, I I think Kelly. Maybe what we want to do is, if Mark's on next week, we can just sort of tee up a, a short discussion around this. Not not you know, sure. Maybe a full update, but I think it'd be worthwhile. Okay, that sounds great. Are there any other uh, questions, at least in the interim, uh, for some of the members of the the PSWG? Okay, uh, well then we will close out uh, this quarterly report. Um, we can always bring this as uh, an agenda item next week just to talk briefly uh, with uh, Mark on as well, since he was unable to make it. Uh, so we'll now move to the uh, discussion topics. Uh, so do you want to introduce uh, the various discussion topics? Sure, um, one is uh, going back and revisiting the incoming freight works guidelines. This is something that my staff needs because of the fact that we do keep having different code bases being proposed and we need to um, be able to uh, talk with them in a more informed fashion in regards to additional frameworks. It kind of helps in regards to the screening process at the very beginning. So one of the things that I did is per, I believe it was Vipin's request, um, I took the uh, new project proposal template and made it into an editable document so that people can add comments easily. Um, and then I can go back and put that into um, when people are actually making those project submittals, um, some language about frameworks versus um, apps versus all of that kind of, um, all the different stuff that we've been discussing previously. So uh, did you want me to go further or just that topic? Uh, I, so I think that's good. Maybe we could just open it up and see. I haven't seen a lot of um, activity on on this on the mailing list. So I was just curious, maybe in, in real time, if anyone had some thoughts about uh, topics or criteria that should be included in the in the sort of new top level proposal. Uh, I think on my end, you know, one of them is it's really around uh, is this a sort of multi stakeholder uh, type project? I think now that we have the labs. We, we sort of have a place to, to incubate and, and grow um, more stakeholders. So that would be one that I would uh, want to consider adding is, you know, do we have a, a diversity of companies or at least two um, that are working on this project? I think <clears throat> for the vendor diversity, that's where we're trying to um, yeah. address that issue. Um, and it is one of the qualifications that we talk about in the um, 
uh, project lifecycle documentation. Um, but yep, this yep. is a little bit more about clarity about um, what is a frameworks and what will the TSC be considering in regards to frameworks going forward because of the fact that we do have fabric and sawtooth in Aroha. Yep. Yeah, this is this is Chris. I mean, I, I you know, I struggle with this one because <laughs> I think, we, you know, um, I, I, I think no matter what type of criteria that you come up with, you know, it's, it's not going to be correct. Uh, I do think that the diversity aspect is, you know, the multi-stakeholder um, is, I think, fundamental. And, you know, actually, we were chatting yesterday with Brian with um, a group that's going to announce today, uh, I don't want to steal their thunder, but, you know, that they have a, that they're, they're, you know, considering open sourcing some, um, some new capability. Um, it's, it's, it's pertinent to fabric, but I suspect that, you know, maybe it could be applied to others as well. Um, and, um, uh, and yet they're like, you know, so what do we do? Do we do a top level project? Do we start it as a lab, you know? And, you know, I think, I think Kelly, you know, to your point, I think maybe the, the labs, you know, sort of start as a lab. If we demonstrate that there's diversity and interest and, you know, it's growing and, you know, then reaches that threshold that we're looking for, then you know maybe it it you know just like versa it it comes out of ink, uh, out of uh, the labs and into incubation, um, and maybe that's the the, the 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 sort of the process rather than trying to have the staff or somebody sort of predetermine whether or not it meets some you know some arbitrary criteria. For the most uh, part, I mean, you know, well, I, I mean, again, I think you know what Brian was looking for you know, potentially was, oh, it has to be something that's unique and we don't already have something like it. And well, okay, you know, possibly, but then again, how do you get the code base into a, into a place where we could then start, you know, uh, you know, sort of consolidating and, and, you know, bringing things together unless you actually provide a place where they can do that here um, within Hyperledger uh, with the appropriate licensing and so forth. We, we, when, we, when we meet with people who do want to bring code, the very first suggestion that the CA team makes is lab first. And, and to sit there and to mm -hmm. do the lab and to sit there and see if they can get the vendor diversity and all of the other different aspects um, first. Uh, but in regards to the frameworks, I think that ends up being a little bit more about what Brian's talking about in regards to uniqueness and that we, didn't, we don't want to become an you know, this is me being cynical, but a dumping ground for a lot of these ICOs um, where they've gone and they've created some roll their own blockchain sort of thing. And now they don't know what to do. So now they want to open source it. Um, and right. so it is kind of to help us a little bit with some of that. Um, but yes, we definitely <clears throat> do try to direct people to the labs first. Right. And we actually had an incident, right? I think maybe just before you joined where somebody was going to, you know, open source their thing and bring it to Hyperledger and then they <laughs> proceeded to immediately go bankrupt. So, <laughs> yeah, so I exactly think I, what was going to happen. Maybe the question here is, is, you know, maybe the status quo should be that you go into the labs uh, prior right. to, I guess, incubation. And then, and then maybe really the question here is, well, in which cases would you switch or like skip the, the lab step? Right. And I could I could see if you've got a diversity of stakeholders, you know, there are obviously established projects out there like Quilt, for instance, that was bringing code and stakeholders along with it. Uh, and I think that one made sense to to move towards a top level project. But maybe that's really the where the discussion is, is in what cases would you skip the, the sort of lab step? Um, I think the, the one sort of nuance there is that obviously the labs does not provide um, either both the marketing as well as the sort of uh, tools, right, in terms of JIRA and Confluence and, and what have you as the incubation projects. And and so I suspect that it, it can be more difficult to actually grow a community without some of those marketing resources. And so I think there there could be reasons that uh, that projects we would say, hey, you should skip the labs and this is, you know, unique enough or you've already got enough, uh, you've got a small contributor, small diverse contributor basis uh, that, that maybe you've already satisfied that. How hard is it to 
move like the code bases from a labs project over to a full project? Trivial. It takes me about uh, two minutes. I was gonna say that wouldn't be bad. And uh, yeah, even even for a big project, getting them started there, getting all the infrastructure in place that's necessary, and then do the conversion um, is not a bad thing. So so we did this for Ursa. Um, it's not too bad to move, but people were pointing out about the tools. Uh, yeah. And it was it was uh, really painful not having some of those tools for kind of, you know, the last month or so or so was in labs. Uh, I can relate to that. Yeah, and maybe this is a, a question for the, the Hyperledger staff is, uh, um, are those tools something that could be opened up to the labs? I understand that there is some maintenance there, uh, obviously, um, in terms of, you know, setting up and maintaining the wiki and the JIRAs and all that sort of stuff. But um, for those that want it, is that something that could possibly be extended? So that's one less reason for people to be looking for a top level project. Yeah, I, I think people would be much more happy starting in labs if they got some of those tools to start. So, I mean, you know, we say got some of those tools. So some of them are, doesn't cost anything to add another project, right? JIRA. Confluence, you just create another three-letter acronym or something for Jira. And for for the wiki, okay, you create a wiki page and child off, you know, children off that. That's not like additional work that the IT staff has to do other than maybe to, you know, add people's accounts and stuff like that. But um, I, I could see, you know, the, the, the case of something like CI where, yeah, you can add um, you know Jenkins jobs and so forth, but then now somebody is helping to maintain those Jenkins, um, you know the JJBs and the and the pipelines and so forth, as well as then there's you know some cloud resource that's being consumed to support the ongoing CI. So that actually does add to the cost of operating, and and so maybe there's like a happy balance where we can let them use the wiki and so forth. And Jira, but you know, for CI, they have to use Travis or something. Yeah, you know, Jira is not free. I want to push back on that. Um, I the number oh, of we have to pay tickets, users. I, the number of tickets, the help desk tickets that we've gotten for people who want special, you know, they want statuses changed, they want uh, you know new workflows, etc. It's you know a, a constant flow of tickets for people who want changes made to Jira. So even if we, you know, have create a Jira project, yes, that is trivial but nobody likes the default workflows, right? And everyone has special groups, so it's not a zero cost. So the cost the cost that you're talking about is our maintenance cost for doing what everybody else wants when, they, when they're coming in. Absolutely, that, yes. Yeah, that makes sense. I would, the other one is my guess is, especially if we start in labs and start having every labs project have access to it, you're gonna end up creating a bunch of orphaned um, uh, projects as part of that as well, so. Yeah, and I think the one the one other piece there that is potentially problematic is is this marketing component, right? So if suddenly you have Kelly Coin sitting right along, you know, whatever Hyperledger Composer or Hyperledger Fabric or what have you, right? It's the, part of the reason was the labs was like sort of, hey, you don't you don't get this full marketing piece until you prove it, and so I think by putting them on the um, it, it, well, maybe we have a separate lab section in the JIRA or the Confluence, but that's just one other consideration that, that we should have. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the labs groups need marketing at all, um, but it might be good to allow them to no, sort of, <laughs> to ask for some of these resources. I, I don't know. I, I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of variance between how involved and how sort of active lab projects are, so. I say we stick to what GitHub gives you, and that's it. I mean, we kind of um, talked I would, about I, it. Yeah, I would say that um, if a group is getting close, it, it'd be okay to get them some rocket chat channels or a mailing list, or um, I think some of those um, collaboration items are helpful to get the project proposal over the finish line. But I think it should feel a lot like what happened with Ursa, where um, you're you're showing some progress towards moving out of labs to get some of those tools. 
Yeah, um, I agree. This is Leonard here. Morning, everyone. I think based on the lessons learned, uh, what I'm hearing from everyone, we really need to sit and put together or work on a standardized tool set for the lab. It's a development environment, and therefore it needs a minimum set of tools to uh, facilitate a development in that area. It's not an incubation, the, the project's there, but they are being developed and looked at and, uh, and amended in some way. So based on the lessons learned today, I'm sure we can come up with a minimum set of tool sets. And where additional capabilities are required, we also have a process um, that needs to be justified and proved to get any additional capabilities in that uh, lab environment, very dependent on the type of project and, 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 and the needs for doing so. But it's something doable in, in putting together a standard set of tools for development based on our experiences to date. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Leonard. And, and maybe that can reduce some of the burden on uh, Hyperledger if, if maybe labs projects are, you get, you, you sort of get what you get, right? Uh, you, you don't get to modify the JIRA workflows and tags and that sort of stuff. Uh, that may be a, a possible way forward. I would I would hate to spend a lot of resources on from the get go. I think what Nage was saying earlier that's a bit more reasonable to me. It's like you know, and maybe there is a middle ground, right? It doesn't have to be they are close to being you know moving to incubation, but you have to get a feeling that there is a real project going on before you can invest resources in this because. I mean, quite frankly, that was part of the deal is we made the threshold to enter into a lab, to create a lab pretty low, which means, you know, a lot of labs may not pan out and we shouldn't invest resources, you know, for the, just blindly. Sure. Um, I was just wondering if there would be some way that labs could ask, uh, say, the TSC or somebody, for these resources. Yeah, so you were saying they could make the case that they deserve to have that kind of resources made available. Yeah, this would have been really nice for Ursa if we could have gotten some of these things like a month earlier. Yeah, that might be reasonable as a case by case basis. And that goes back to also if, if we're trying to push um, projects into labs before they come up for consideration for incubation, that would also um, provide a means to get them enough of the resources that we could do a, a, a serious evaluation. Yeah, I would say that that seems reasonable as well. Um, maybe just before we, we jump on to uh, the next topic, I just wanted to just ask very briefly if anyone had thoughts around what criteria um, folks think is reasonable for for uh skipping labs so is there are there any sort of must-haves that you think would uh need to be part of a proposal if it were not to go through labs first uh, since it sounds like we're we're somewhat converging on labs should be the the default um i think the the principal criteria for me is that is it coming in as a multi-vendor active project or is it coming in as a jump start from the beginning if it's coming in as a jump start from the beginning, it should go through labs. If it's coming in with an active community that's taking some existing um, multi-vendor code base and adding it to a hyperledger, then I think we can skip through that. Uh, did I we not have at some point? See... Go ahead. I think we're going to see one more track that I think will become more common, and that is I think we'll see projects that have been incubated within existing projects. I think some of the projects we have that came out of the fabric community meet, meet this criteria, where it may not have been incubated directly in labs, but it might have been, been incubated as a, a feature in Sawtooth that is now kind of grown into its own project or a feature in one of the other frameworks. So I think whatever we, we kind of write up as a design here should probably also account for that case as well. Yes, and I thought last year we had some form of a template proposal in place or considering uh, you might say requested projects for lab um, <clears throat> so for lab implementation and that would also have a checklist 
to go along with it to determine if that, well, the level of stability for that project and whether we would accept it uh, to become a lab project. Uh, I thought there was a, 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 um, a template proposal of some sort, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I thought that's how we were started last year. Uh, was that about just a proposal for to enter into incubation? Is, was that what you're no, saying? The lab, no, for the lab itself. Oh yes, there is, there is a template for the labs. With a checklist that of course, um, process being what it is, can always be improved and should always be improved. So we should look at the checklist and see, um, is it sufficient today for some of the projects really that are just, you might say, an idea, but does not have that, um, that solidity based in terms of support and backing um, to become a fully fledged project that will <laughs> be sustainable. So I think we need to look at the checklist associated with that template proposal and bring it up to snuff, so to speak, going forward again on best practices and lessons learned to date. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think, you know, because we only have about uh, another 20 minutes here, I think we should, should move on. I think the, the key things that uh, at least I've heard is that, you know, many folks believe that labs is uh, a reasonable default starting point. Uh, if a community has uh, an existing code base and an existing community around, then that could be a reason to go uh, sort of straight towards incubation. And I think one of the unresolved uh, sort of issues is, is to what extent do labs projects get access, at least to the collaboration tools. Um, and, it, and it sounds like one potential path forward on that may be that, that they're not granted those from the get-go, but that they could come request those uh, from the TSC. Um, so I just encourage everyone to to follow up on the the email threads uh, that are posted here. I think this has been a, a great discussion, and uh, I think we resolved a number of, of issues and got some good uh, conversation out of it. Uh, moving on, uh, Salona, do you want to talk about the the next couple discussion topics? So the next one, um, and uh, Arnaud put in a good comment in regards to this about um, how it should read uh, the role of the lab sponsors and his proposed definition in regards to it um, as to what we're doing in regards to sponsors and what we expect out of them for the labs. This kind of rolls into the topic as to what we were just having because this is probably our biggest gating function is that they have to have a lab sponsor. So I don't know why, I don't see the comment. I mean, I see you see it on Zoom, but uh, <laughs> when I look at the page, my comment is gone and I don't, no indication there's even a comment. So I don't know if it's just me, if other people see. What is it? I, about? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. We're, I, I we're hiding it from you, Arno. <laughs> you see it, Mick? Um, I don't see, I have not looked. At, uh, did you put it on the agenda? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I think yeah, I, I can see it all the way in Canada. It says the one that says on the Arno, this should, this should read but all of the lab do sponsors. Do you see it from the web page? Yeah, I don't, see I don't see it from the web page. I Not see from that the it's yellow page. as if it's been commented. Ah. I, I you have to, you just click on the yellow and it pops up. It's hidden. Oh, if you click on the yellow, then, you, then it'll pop up and then you can see the comment. All right. I uh, see okay, I see yeah, how it works. Right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. We're we're learning the new wiki at the same time. <laughs> yes. Well, that's nice. So that I don't have to just put my comments down at the end. I can actually inline them. This is good. Uh, and now that we have this proposed uh, definition up, um, I suspect you know not everyone's had a chance to read it, but perhaps uh, everyone could just quickly read this and and see if they have any feedback on this definition. And I am screen sharing it so that you can read it. But if you notice, you can also go underneath and put additional comments there too, as well on the inline. And you can put comments at the end of the document too.
Yeah, I, I think it's a, I guess from my perspective, I think it's a, uh, a good definition um, that that's been consistent with sort of my view of, of the role of the lab sponsors uh, there. Any other comments or feedback on uh, Arno's proposed definition? Looks good to me. Okay. Uh, if there's no other feedback, uh, I suggest we move on to the APAC bootcamp topic. But wait, so is that approved? Should we just go ahead and I think it would be good to have a resolution that we can add that to the lab description. I don't think that we have, uh, if this is, I'm not sure that this is something that really requires a vote. Um, so I, I would suggest that we move forward with this. Um, we don't have quorum today, I do not believe. So um, okay. I don't think we can do an official vote, but my recommendation would be that uh, I haven't heard any objections. So I would suggest that that we move forward and um, if there are objections, we can we can readdress it. But this seems like the seems like an appropriate definition to move forward on. I right, purposely haven't gotten super formal on the lab definitions. Um, if you notice in the wiki, the project life cycle cannot be altered without a vote from the TSC. But in regards to labs, I think we're trying to be a little bit freer on that. And so if we start making things more official, I think that might slow us down a bit. So. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so we can note that uh, we're going to move forward with this definition, but uh, it, it wasn't voted on. And, and if anyone has any objections, we can uh, talk about those. Thank you. Okay, the um, Hong Kong boot camp. Um, we, I, I don't know how many of y'all are up to date on it, but we opened up registration and we're filled in less than 24 hours. So um, I've, I've got, a, I actually held back a fair number of seats. Um, for that reason, we're also talking with the venue about expanding the number of attendees for it. Um, so that we can, you know, because I did hold back spots for all of the, um, the uh, session leaders, all the people who are leading the sessions and things of that nature. And then Julie and I are actually going through and we're going to go groom the wait list to sit there and see who really must be there to get them all in to the event. Um, and the sessions are now um, starting to fill up so that we've got a lot of different representatives from the majority of the projects that will be attending and doing um, their uh, onboarding. Uh, a number of the projects have gotten really into it and they're actually creating reusable materials for the other boot camps. So even when the maintainers themselves can't attend the boot camp, um, they will have the materials ready so that someone else um, who's in that region can actually um, use their materials for it. And we're looking at translating some of those materials as well. So it's looking really good. Any questions on the Hong Kong boot camp? Okay, um, the contributor summit. I'm still in a little bit of a holding spot right now in that I'm talking still with events for location and I haven't heard back on that yet. Um, similarly with the boot camps in India and Brazil, um, though it looks like Brazil is probably going to be around the May timeframe um, because it'll be one month after Brian goes down there to visit and kind of rallies the troops. Um, I can't get one ready, I don't think, um, for their visit in April, but right afterwards I think would be a good time to capture that energy that they've inspired and so we're looking into that as well. Um, on the Contributor Summit, are uh, you also looking at uh, potentially appending this onto the Members Summit in Japan? Uh, not currently. Um, I was wondering if um, I was going to suggest looking at having a one day of unconference instead um, so that we can take advantage of who's there, but not necessarily force everyone to go to two events. 
Okay. I think, I mean, one of the things I, I recall hearing in last week's meeting is that there was a, a desire, of, at least among some of the members, to, to have that be a single event, both from a sort of getting it approved from work, but also just, uh, you know, less travel um, for them. So I, I'm not sure if that's something that we, you know, is worth uh, discussing more here, um, or if anyone has any new opinions on it. I, you know, certainly, uh, I think it'd it would be my preference. I think it's easier to get, um, you know, a single international trip approved for a few days longer than uh, multiple international trips. We were looking at the contributor summit, by the way, being in Canada. So not as difficult for the majority of members, but yes, all travel is always international travel. Okay. Um, so maybe that's just, I, I know, I think Brian had said in the last meeting, maybe we could look at doing that at a, a lower cost location, like a university or something to that effect in uh, Japan. So maybe, maybe worthwhile seeing if there, there is an option like that uh, in addition to the, the Canada option. We should talk to our friends at Soromitsu because they may have some ideas. Uh, they're connected to Tokyo University. Um, yeah, so the Aroha team might be able to help us out there. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we, we, Go we ahead. should also reach out to NEC. They're a, a, they are a steward on the Sovereign Network and have been involved in the Sovereign community, so they might have some ideas on what could help there. Yeah, we can, uh, we can talk to people too. I mean, Brian said that I think the member summit was going to be someplace like a little off the beaten path in Japan. But if we're already going to be in Japan, you know, we could do some. We could do a few days in in Tokyo or something like that for a contributor meeting, where we would find probably it much easier to get meeting space. Okay, I so the, I think uh, the member summit was already in Tokyo. The the member summit is. Uh, we had had last week was is it possible to have the contributor summit you know either just before or just after that uh because most of the the maintainers are going to want to be going to the member summit anyway and that would be one less uh trip to to have okay it sounds like there's some some potential uh pass there um so per, perhaps some of us could um so maybe we can work offline and just uh, have a conversation with Brian as well as as to the feasibility of that. Uh, I know that there has been already some existing work going on for to have it in Canada, uh, but it sounds like there is a preference for many folks to uh, have that as a single uh, single trip. All right, and then I think. Um, the the last uh, update here under the discussion was around the election of a new chair for the Le learning materials uh, development working group uh the ask by the tsc uh, bobby had nominated herself for that chair um the ask by the tsc on that was for her to send an email out to the working group to see if there was anyone else interested in running or if anyone had an issue uh, with her assuming that chair role it sounds like that is that has not yet happened uh, so this will be an uh, agenda item that we'll push into the next week. Yeah, she hasn't sent the email, but there is another person who wants to be her vice chair that's also been regularly attending the meetings, but it's only been three to five people who regularly attend the meeting. So she does need to send something that's an outreach to the group in its entirety. All right, fantastic. Um, are there any other announcements or uh, discussion topics from the Hyperledger staff? Okay, uh, from the Hyperledger technical community, does anyone have any uh, opens or items that they would like to discuss before we adjourn? All right, uh, well, with no, uh, no objections, I will move forward with ending today's meeting. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, appreciate uh, all the TSC members getting in and marking the check, check boxes and reading the uh, reports and updates in advance. I think that was really useful in, 
and gave us a good amount of time to discuss other topics. And uh, Salone, I think uh, you and I can chat offline. Maybe we can just look at uh, maybe bringing in in Hart or Dave or others to look um, for space in Japan and, and let's look at the feasibility of, of perhaps bringing the members and contributor summits together. All right, thanks everyone, have a great day.